not an interview because you already know that they've got the basic attributes and skills to do the job because they've already done it. You were sad that they left. It's more about having a kind of adult to adult conversation that says, right, what was it that made you want to leave in the first place? And if you did want to leave, what can we do to overcome that? You know, that is going to enhance the positives of what you enjoyed about working here previously and remove the negatives. Hello and welcome to Work Smart, a podcast from Social Talent that's all about becoming more work smart. I'm Johnny Campbell, CEO and co-founder of Social Talent, and this week we're talking to David Bremer. David Bremer has been in the retail space for all of his career. He's a VP of Talent Acquisition that's worked with companies like TK Maxx, Boots, uh, Kingfisher, who own uh, B&Q, and Ocado, who you may not have heard of, but have been a big explosion in the retail scene over the last couple of years. Dave is going to be joining us today to talk about rebound hiring. Let's do this. So David, you're very welcome to the podcast. Wondering if you could just share a little bit about your career background and what brought you here. Yeah. Uh, David Bremer, I've worked in TA now for over 20 years i started in consulting like lots of people do uh back uh with a company called computer people for about four or five years where i ran accounts for ministry of defense and then subsequently worked in energy banking finance and more predominantly as you said like retail sectors and e-com sectors over the last kind of 10 years of my career really as a head of ta um and yeah I, now i'm doing some consulting work currently with Kantar public and um, and here we are that's me Rebound hiring. Tell me yeah. a little bit about the topic, why you're passionate about it, why it's been something you've been talking about recently. So I'm super I'm super passionate about it. It's it's a it's a topic that I don't think enough kind of companies are heavily indexing enough on, right? So you start so many kind of conversations in my experience and, and in my past experience when you talk to a hiring manager and they say, Oh, do you remember like Miguel? You know, we we need someone like Miguel. And you kind of go, well, what's wrong with Miguel? Like, why wouldn't you want to talk to Miguel, right? And kind of bring him back or, you know, Sandeep or, you know, whoever it might be. And that kind of just got me thinking. And, and even this has been years for me in the making, right? But I started working on something along these lines back at Boots back in about 2011, 2012. Um and I actually I created a team at the time, a small team of only just four people who would work basically on calling back through people who had left us. And this is pre-GDPR, right? So let me just kind of lay my stall out. Um, we, we were using data within the confines of the, of the system back then. But, um, we would just routinely call people at a point where they'd left us. They'd been gone for a month. They'd been gone two months, three months. And what I actually found was that once you calibrated good levers versus bad levers, so the people that you wanted back versus the people you didn't, if you were to reach out to people, we were typically able to re-engage between 10 and 20% of the talent that we'd lost that we didn't want to lose, right? So right. with Boots, that manifested itself in a, in a really positive way, and we rehired a series of optometrists that we were largely you know, on the hook with agencies for because it was a really agency-dominated market. Um, and whatever we tried to do internally was very difficult to try and kind of, you know, get the direct source type numbers that you would expect. Um, I then used it furthermore, more recently, you know, with Ocado and the tech team. Again, we rehired approximately 10% of the people that we reached back out to from a tech space. Um, and I think it comes down to one fundamental thing, really, is that people leave companies from multitude of different reasons, right? So they might lose, leave because of money or because of their boss or because they're not getting the furtherment or that kind of talent trajectory that they were looking for. And actually, it doesn't really matter what the reason is. In a number of instances, people's pride kind of gets in the way, right? So there's a proactivity that's required when it comes to rebound hiring that is absolutely necessary and it's predicated on having really good recruiters who are really humble and able to have good conversations but 70 percent of people when i did a poll on this 70 percent of people would not routinely reach back out to their old company if their new company was not what it was promised to be which i think called a magnitude of stories right so if you're in that 70 percent of people that wouldn't have you know the ability to overcome their pride 
right? Or the humility to kind of pick up a phone and say, listen, my old, to my old boss, made a mistake. I didn't realize how much I valued my previous job. I've got to the new company. It's not what I expected. Yes, the money's better, but I'm working with people that I don't really, you know, respect or value or whatever it might be. And the challenge isn't quite what they suggested it would be. If you take that out of their hands and you kind of routinely make phone calls at a three month period and then a six month period and you track your bad leavers that the people you didn't want to leave, just to just connect and talk to people and have meaningful conversations with them. You can re-engage and you can rehire. And typically, it could account for up to like 10% of your total hiring if you're attrition, as it was in Boots and as it was in Ocado and technology. You know, if your attrition is, is, is suggesting that you have an opportunity, if you're in a company that's 200 people and you've got a 5% attrition rate, this is not necessarily for you, right? But if you're in a large enterprise business like an Ocado, like an Amazon, like a Meta or whatever... If you're really not tapping into your boomerang community or your rehires, then you're you're really missing a trick. So what stunned me about what you're saying there, David, is the time period. Because I have heard about boomerang hiring or rebound hiring in the past. Yeah. I've made an assumption, obviously incorrectly, that this is about people who left you three, four, five years ago. But I'm getting the sense that you're saying it's actually not that it's in the first three to six months or less even, and that's the opportune time. What kind of data or insights do you have on, on the sweet spot time to reach out to somebody? So I guess that that's where the differentiation comes in between what's a rebound and what's an alumni, right? And the reason that I kind of, I, I emphasize quite heavily on the three to six months is because I think that's the best time for you to capitalize on someone who's having an auto reject approach with a company right so if you've gone to a company and, it, and it's really absolutely not sitting well with you then that's your window of opportunity at three months that's also where your probationary period is right typically and then if that gets that extended out it goes to six months when i'm talking about this kind of stuff I don't want you to think that rebounds only constitute people who bounce back into the company after three or six months that's absolutely not the case but the the, the the differentiation in the terminology that you might use is what's a rebound versus what's an alumni hire. Because if you commit very well to your alumni networks and you start communicating with people on a really meaningful level about, you know, you know we're still doing this, we're still doing that, we'd love to hear any referrals that you've got for this or for that, you're embracing that community and communicating well with it, that's when it becomes your alumni community maybe six, 12 months down the line. And that will be different for every company. But the, the rebound period, I just think you have an extra gift. There's like that extra nugget of opportunity, I think, at that three-month window, where if you're really tracking incredibly brilliant, successful people who leave, you can bring them back in. I think you and I have been doing recruiting since probably the same time, right? When we were yeah. nappies in the 90s. But <laughs> yeah. um, I, I, I've, always, I've always found this pattern, and I say it to people, um, when they're in a job a long time, like let's say five, six years plus, almost uh -huh. certainly the next job they have won't work out. And then they'll have to move to another job that will work out. It's kind of, when you're a long time in a company, you, you typically are let down. Your expectations aren't what, what, what you expect in the very next job you take, almost certainly. And then the job after that is a bit better and you stay years perhaps. Have you seen any patterns in, you know, this is more successful people who've been with the company a long time who leave? Are short term and leave, or is there no pattern? The thing is, with with the whole rebound hiring piece, there isn't a lot of data out there on this, right? So right. unless you've routinely done this as a company and as an institution, you won't have that type of data. Statistically, if someone leaves after like ten years worth of service, they're probably leaving for much bigger reasons, right? They might be relocating, they might be doing whatever, you know, but. I think the opportunity really is is within probably your more transient communities and probably within certain generations too, right? So if you were just trying to engage people of a certain demographic at a certain level to rehire, that makes absolute sense. The chances are you're probably not going to be trying to go out and rehire your ex-CPO or your ex-chief marketing officer, there was probably a very good reason why they moved on in the first place. And companies tend not to circle back at that type of executive level. Um, but what I'm talking about here is typically the the rebound hiring piece works where you've got a specific skill set um, 
or a niche skill or a volume skill set. So if I take us back to the Boots example, at Boots there were, when we're talking about optometrists, there were 12,000 registered optometrists in the UK at that time, right? Boots had had pretty much every, you know, optometrist either go through their pre-grad or, you know, grad schemes, right? Um, for a number of years, and they employed a couple of thousand optometrists, I believe it was at the time, can't remember. We had a very specific market, a very specific skill set, and we were able to tap into that very, very simply um, because we had the, the gift of data, but also it was a very transparent and transactional space. So you could consistently approach every optometrist with the view that actually the only differentiating factor would probably be the location that they were going to work in, right? I think it's very different these days if you're talking about very specific people in very specific, you know, kind of areas of tech. If you're talking back end Python, front end Java guys, whatever it might be, right? You probably wouldn't necessarily apply exactly the same logic. Um, but the, the premise of, of trying to kind of re, re engage and re reach out to these people is that there's more to be done. You feel like there's kind of unfinished business. And whether they left because it was money, because they weren't getting the progression, they weren't doing this, they weren't doing that, you know, and they felt unsatisfied. You have to, the biggest challenge with it is about re-engaging them on the level of which they left. Because if not, what you're going to see is, much like with counter offers, someone might take a counter offer, they might stay in their company, right? But then statistically, X amount then still leave within six to nine months. You have to overcome the objection what it was that made them leave the place. If you're just going to routinely offer them more money, they may well come back initially, but they'll probably still be dissatisfied for the same reasons they left in the first place. David, I'm concerned that maybe some leaders listening to this might be slightly dismissive because they're thinking, oh, in retail, that works. You know, this guy worked in Boots, he worked in TK Maxx. But Ocado, just to be clear, Ocado is an e-commerce business. Oh, That's yeah. a lot more similar to a corporate organization with developers and engineers. And this worked there too. Is that correct? Yeah. It, not only did it work there, but it worked in tech, right? Um, so I was, I was very lucky though, in the sense that we had some, some fantastic leaders within that tech space who were really, in, you know, they were it, part of it, you know, they wanted to be part of this kind of co-op of ideas and things that we tried and different solutions and stuff. And the whole rehiring thing or the boom, boomerang hiring piece, we, we trialed it across two or three different areas. Um, and we got an over, over 10% kind of, a, you know, um, rehire rate at the time which which was great and you know that's tech within a a really high-end ai automation auto, you know automation and robotics kind of space we're not talking about you know ms office engineers right we're, we're talking about really top end you know uh engineers and and it's i think it can be applied to any given market and yes i can i guess you can kind of write me off as a the retail guy or the e-com guy right and say well yeah i get why it works there but the tr the truth of it is for a lot of the skills that a lot of companies have hiring is really expensive and it's not just really expensive because if you look at you know the comparative between agency versus in-house it's super expensive because of the opportunity costs right there was a statistic that said that it can cost up to 75 percent of the basic salary of the individual based on opportunity costs, roll off times, roll up times for your new hire, et cetera, et cetera, right? And you can have an inefficiency up to 75% of a salary. So if there's a company who can take someone who not only has the knowledge of the business, the knowledge of the systems, the knowledge of the people and the objectives and how the organization works, who is also, by the way, going to get back up to speed at least 10 times faster than a complete new starter to an organization why wouldn't that be a total no-brainer, right? But also, you know, why wouldn't you want to stay connected to these people? You mentioned at the start, um, you make it you make a split, if you like, between those who want to rehire and those who don't want to rehire. How do you get that information? Like, is it that is it captured when the person resigns? You ask the hiring manager, would you rehire this person? Or is it just on a case-by-case -case basis, you're going back to each previous manager to ask them? So... I think how you differentiate between a good lever and a bad lever is all dictated by your exit process and your exit interview process, right? So a bus as a business, the HRBP will know if someone has been managed out of the business through performance or, you know, uh, misconduct, whatever it might be. And of course, those people 
you know, the business would probably or very, very likely choose not to re-engage, right? But it's all dictated largely by the consistency of that exit interview process and how you identify those levers. Um, and realistically, that can in some companies look like the HRBP does the exit interview. In some instances, a hiring manager might do the exit interview, which is a bit silly because, of course, if the hiring manager is the problem and that's why someone's leaving, of course, you're never really going to probably hear that. Or maybe, maybe you will, and that might be a bit explosive. In some instances, I've even heard of recruiters kind of doing the exit interviews, which is sure. bizarre. Um, you need to have the data to be able to support that in the first instance. Um, and that is a really important calibration. If you don't calibrate who is a good lever versus a bad lever, what you could actually end up doing is, is, is causing some kind of very difficult legal difficulties if you've ended up managing someone out of the business and they're on a comp, comp agreement or something along those kind of lines. So... Um, yeah, something really to pay attention to. Um, if you can, exit interviewing online is 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 very useful because then you get the insight, you get to share that, you get to put that and segment it by different departments, by different teams, by different leaders, different levels, different locations, and then you can feed that back in and use that also for your EVP, which I think is super important. What What's the process of... I hate to say the word because maybe this is the wrong word, re-interviewing somebody. Do you re-interview them? Or is it a case of if you want the job back, it's yours? What, what does the process look like? I think it depends on what the problem is that you're trying to overcome, right? So if someone left the business and it was on the basis of salary, let's say, right? So I used to work for a retailer, and I won't say which one it was because I don't think it'd be particularly diplomatic, but I used to work for a retailer, and we would routinely lose people to competitor retailers down the street so someone maybe on a 45k salary, the competitor down the street has offered them 50, but then we wouldn't give them the 50 to get, to get them to stay. We would let them leave, however, and then we'd rehire them in a year's time on 53, which was absolute madness, right? And that happened routinely, like all of the time. I guess what it comes down to is you've got to be comfortable that A, are that is that person or those persons coming back into the same team is what you have to offer what they had previously the question then is what is the obstacle that you've got to overcome is it salary is it that they didn't like the leader that they were working for is it that they just didn't work very well within that specific team is it that they wanted further and you can give it to them so you need to just have it's, it tends to be a one-stage conversation it's not an interview because you already know that they've got the basic attributes and skills to do the job because they've already done it. You were sad that they left. It's more about having a kind of adult to adult conversation that says, right, what was it that made you want to leave in the first place? And if you did want to leave, what can we do to overcome that? You know, that is going to enhance the positives of what you enjoyed about working here previously and remove the negatives. Because if not, it's just going to work like that kind of counter offer culture, like I said before, where you, you're just going to end up losing people like six, nine months down the line. You have to commit as a company to fix what it was that that person left for. And so, yeah, typically that's a one stage conversation rather than it is uh, an interview. And it also tends to be in person most effectively. I'd imagine that there are some instances where the person's going to rejoin in a different team or a slightly different role because maybe there wasn't the opportunity when they left and now it is does exist three months later or you really like the person to your point you have the conversation it's maybe about the boss they don't want to go back and work for that boss but they love the company love the culture um you know does that typically then instigate a new interview because it's a slightly different team or role or, or you know how flexible is this process definitely i mean it, it, there has to be some i think you need some policies and principles right so your policy probably says, do we rehire people who left us, you know, under a black cloud of performance and whatever? No. Um, if we rehire someone and they're coming back, A, into a different role, or B, to a different hiring manager or department or location, do we have an interview? Yes. If they're coming back to exactly the same or previous substantive role that they held, do you go through an interview process? Probably not. I think it's just about kind of setting it up in a way that's going to kind of be successful for you and for your business, right? So if, if you normally have like a seven-stage interview process, um, 
if someone's going to come back into a, a kind of a more or a less technical role, you might want to put them through some of the kind of the, you know, the process. Previously. But largely what we're talking about here is the types of skill sets where you're going to rehire people typically to do similar, if not slightly different roles to what they've been doing previously. You're not going to be reaching out to a necessary a marketing manager and saying, would you come back as our chief marketing officer, right? Um, so I guess the differentiation is, are you coming back as a, an engineer or an engineering team leader or an engineering manager or blah, 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 just to use the, you know, the, the types of techn- the terminology we've been using so far. Um, but I think it's all about policy. You have to set this stuff up in the first place and have some basic guidelines and principles that set it up. And they'll either set it up for success or they'll set it up for failure. Do you ever get, you mentioned obviously the pride piece from the cat, from the, the employee who left, right? But what about the other way around? Do you ever get any pushback from the manager? You know, she said, you know, this employee was great. We'd rehire them. But then when, when the opportunity arises to rehire them, they're just not as happy because maybe they, I don't know, maybe they said things about that person when they left the rest <laughs> of the team or does that ever come up where you get the, the opposite problem? It's not massively come up in, in my experience, but I mean, obviously take into account this, it's not typically me that's calling these guys, right? It's the, it's the teams that I have. So I might hear occasional kind of anecdotal feedback of, well, yeah, we would definitely rehire them. We're really, they were really good. But um, sometimes it's kind of like, yeah, they were, they were amazing at their job and they did a fantastic job and we could really do with that set of hands right now. But you know what they, they were a little bit disruptive with the team or you know they were quite distracting to other people or, or that kind of thing and um, I guess you just kind of got to add it up right and, and and top things up and kind of say well was that person you know were that person's downsides more of a problem than their upsides and if so they would be on the no no higher list right so um you may occasionally get a bit of bad feeling if if someone has, has left a, a team and they've come back at a slightly higher level as a result of leaving, right? So let's say that they re-engineered, uh, you know, uh, re-entered the business and they did so at a slightly higher level than the level that they were at previously. You do run the risk, of course, of alienating or, or kind of isolating other people who were also at that level and chose not to leave and chose to stick around, right? So you've just got to be kind of clear on your guiding principles as to why you want to do this stuff. That's the key for me. So you mentioned the example from your past of the regular occurrence of folks leaving, let's say, for forty on forty five grand for fifty, coming back at fifty three the year later, right? Um, yeah, yeah. 2020, 2023 being a seminal year for pay transparency legislation. Oh, wow. We've seen the EU introduce a new directive in July twenty twenty three that has three years to be enforced by law across the EU. That's going to uh, require the publication of uh, job salary ranges. And it's going to ban asking candidates about their current previous salaries. Uh, the U.S. has done the same in states like Washington, New York, New Jersey, mm-hmm. and several others, California and stuff. Uh, and this seems to be gaining momentum. The U.K. has started a two-year pilot for volunt- companies to volunteer for this as well. So it's likely going to come into the U.K. as well in the next couple of years. With that in mind, right, where you'll have a situation that if I'm in a team and um, I'm going to see roles advertised, we know that people externally typically earn more money, right? Than yeah. the existing team there. Do you think that could lead to more people exiting because they're, you know, not happy with this disparity and therefore, you know, driving perhaps more of a need to have an approach to boomerang or rebound hiring because, you know, it's really addressing this pay imbalance we all know exists, but it's going to yeah. really become more public over the next few months and years. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, in one of my previous companies, again, I won't say which one it was, I brought together a couple of different recruiting teams as part of, of, of that work, right? And there was massive disparity in the recruiter salaries, just in the fact that some of them were super tenured, some of them weren't, some of them had been in the business for a short time because they'd been in four or five other companies and they'd worked their way up the kind of the salary levels, right? And then came in and arguably had less experience than people they were working alongside, but they were earning so much more. Sure. EU directive is going to mean over the next three years is that companies have really got to get their act together when it comes to the, you know, internal disparities of pay and salary. And woe betide them if they don't, because yeah, it is going to lead to a huge, you know, tsunami of levers when it comes to 
people who just feel undervalued and, and, and underpaid. And I'm sure you've seen this and, you know, I've seen recruiter salaries, it, you know, I've paid recruiters as high as a hundred thousand pounds in the past in my teams. I've paid recruiters as, as, as little as, you know, 27, 28,000 pounds. And arguably they're doing a comparable job. What you're paying for is the experience, right? Um, but I think what this new EU regulation is going to do is it's, it's going to force companies to be a little bit clearer and it's going to, and it's going to force just that greater level of granular kind of transparency that is going to enable people to make decisions about whether they do or do not want to move between companies, between industries, whatever, right? You know, if you're in hospitality, traditionally, not as a rule, but traditionally, salaries can be a lot lower than if you are working yeah. in one of the big tech firms or in one of the big banking firms or in, in even the big four, right? And, and if you are able to mindfully make that decision about your career and about your future based on facts, that's a positive thing. The, the biggest opportunity to fail here is by the companies and, you know, the comp and bends directors who just don't face into it quickly enough and regulate stuff and, and get things leveled out. And it won't be down to TA, it'll be down to reward. So if you're a TA leader listening to this podcast, watching this broadcast, and you're excited about this, you think, okay, I need to be looking at this. What's your kind of final recommended first step? Like, where do you start as a TA leader? If you want to start investigating this, put some effort behind it, think there's an opportunity here, we do scaled hiring. What do you recommend as the first thing a leader can do to start this process in their organization? You've got to look at the data. Right, you've got to look at the data. You've got to look at the trends. You've got to understand what it means um, for you and for your your organization. Right. So, if you are within an organization that hires a specific number of people for a very specific role, so let's say you're a you know a huge call center business and you have absolutely loads of people that work for you in different shared service centers and that kind of stuff, you've got a huge gift of opportunity to be able to kind of look at the data that you have of your levers. You know. If you've got any talent data, which a lot of companies don't necessarily have, um, just around you know talent grids and nine boxes or, or whatever it might be, um, you can then correlate it against that and see you know which particular levers uh, are going, who are high potential. Try and do some research into why they're leaving. But ultimately, you should be able to tell where you've got really high attrition, and that's where you start your work. Really, we had huge high attrition in the optometrist space in Boots, and that was why I started it there. And um, we piloted it, obviously, then within within Ocado, and I'd done different bits with with TK Max on, on trying to rehire people, and I certainly did within Kingfisher a little bits of that as well. But it was never as targeted because when you're looking at kind of group head office or something like that, for an example, you might lose one marketing analyst. Right, and then you might not need to recruit another marketing analyst for another eighteen or twenty-four months. At which point, it's not it's not necessarily relevant. But if you're talking about being a company like Boots, you've got you know a couple of thousand pharmacists, a couple of thousand optometrists. That's a sweet spot. If you're you know an Accenture or you know one of these kind of really big kind of uh, firms that has huge HR shared service centers or shared service centers, customer service centers in Poland in in the UK, in Scotland, wherever, that's absolutely a sweet spot for you. Um, I would start where the volume is. I would start where the attrition is. I would look at the data and I'll go from there. Um, and obviously, you know, I tend to be quite generous with my type. So pick up the phone and I have to kind of talk you through how I've done it in the past. Um, there are one or two different platforms that are being developed right now out there um, that I won't kind of pitch today, but there are one or two different platforms that are out there right now that a product and a solution for this. And I think that will be the future of it for right now. If you're in a company that doesn't have a great ATS or doesn't have a great backlog of data or insight when it comes to your attrition, your turnover, your hiring volumes, et cetera, um, then it's, it's probably going to be a difficult thing for you to do without those systems. Um, but if you do, it's got a lot of potential for so this show is called Work Smart for a reason. Right now, David, we want to focus on how you make yourself work smart if you do it all, mate. Are you ready? Hey, go for it. I'm in. Let's do it. Okay, David, we've got some work smart questions from the team at Social Talent behind 
these categories, right? It'll let you pick the category you want to answer from the following six. So let me read them out for you. The categories are teacher's pet, workspace jam. What the heck is workspace jam? Seesaw, tool time, the chill zone, or robot rock. What do you want to go for, David? I'm immediately You're drawn to teacher's pet. Let's go with teacher's pet. <laughs> ah, okay, let's do it. Okay, so teacher's pet. Let's do this. Question is, David, what place does learning hold in your career? What has been the role of learning in your career? Where do you position it? What does it mean to you? So to me, it means quite a lot. Um, I, I'm a big fan of learning. I'm a big fan of, of kind of how I now apply that as a leader of other leaders, if you know what I mean, to make sure that that kind of rolls down to the teams that you have the fundamental education and, um, and curriculum and stuff that, that people expect. But moreover, from a personal point of view, um, one of the best companies I ever worked for was TJX Corporation. Uh, or TJX Europe as they were at the time, which is the brand that owns uh, TK Maxx and HomeSense, right? And they invested just constantly, you know, in my development as a coach, as a mentor, you know. Um, we were very loyal, you know, customers at the time, um, obviously of social talent, you know, and you and I, of which there were, you know, 30 or 40 people at the time. I'm not sure what they have now, but um, I think... That was the last kind of big period of my career where I was invested in really heavily by an employer um, and and I really valued it. And I think I've had it since in the form of not necessarily learning from a curriculum kind of point of view and stuff like that, but from the point of view of, you know, companies who will pay for the right support from a, a mentor, right, or from a, an external coach for you to be kind of feeling like you're you're kind of being developed and and what have you um and also once you kind of get to those kind of head of roles or the, the ta director type roles typically there's there's not actually a load of kind of great content out there or, or, or great kind of courses and stuff to go on. it's a lot of university type stuff um or an mba in this or, or whatever it might be so i think it's then learning becomes something different learning becomes the way that you digest it becomes kind of different so it's like um, webinars and it's about kind of going to lunch and learns or it's about kind of going to networking dinners where it's all kind of chat and past rules everybody's sharing you know really interesting kind of anecdotal stories about cool stuff that they're doing I think the way that you learn becomes very different um, throughout your TA career I think there's a lot of tactical operational stuff that you need to learn and the fundamentals and the basics when you're a recruiter and then you learn more about partnering and and how that works and then as you get up the ladder you learn more about capex and opex and how you can work budgets and how you work with the board on an esg you know on your esg commitments and that kind of stuff at the once you get to the kind of the top and it's i guess the way that you learn and the how much there is to digest changes um and i find that i learned so much more from having amazing conversations with amazing peers uh out in the business, out in the industry, sorry, uh, is, is 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 really my best learning these days, and I value it hugely. I, I literally had three conversations with three different heads of TA yesterday, um, and I tend to talk to you know seven, eight people a week. I just I see it as part of my learning. I love that. I agree with you. I I probably spent too much time at home in my home office in the pandemic, the first couple of years, yeah, and then last year didn't get out enough. This year. I've got out, I've met with maybe 40 or 50 customers so far this year, and it's the best education you get. Just talking to leaders, what's your problem? What are you working on? How are you fixing it? What are you thinking of? And th there's no there's no master's degree that's going to teach you that stuff. It's just gold. David, thank you so much for joining us today. Listen, you've left us with tons of education and learning. You've taught a lot of our listeners and guests so much here today. If anyone wants to follow up with you, get any more information, how can they reach out to you? LinkedIn, uh, or you can send me uh, an email. Uh, I'm happy to give out my email address. It's david at bondu.io, B O N D U.io. Um, and I'll happily go back to any emails. Uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, reach out. I'm happy to have a chat with anybody, um, much to my wife's frustration, because I'm just constantly walking around the house 24 hours a day on my phone, and she doesn't always realize that I'm talking. <laughs> 
and then she just interrupt me and ask me a sam you know question about a sandwich or something but like, i'll just on the phone to the TA director blah, blah, blah. <laughs> i think that's a different show he wants to dave never marry your recruiter it's like you you gotta know what you're gonna get into this person's gonna talk all day long they're gonna get to six o'clock and they're gonna want to talk to nobody else because you're dull <laughs> yeah exactly my wife wants to talk about her day when she's finished at my at the finish of my day i just want to sit myself on the sofa and uh and my my talking's done i do this all day every day and i love it it's wonderful but by the time it gets to the evening there's none left <laughs> david it's it's been an absolute pleasure thanks so much for joining us uh wish, wish you every success we're keen to give some follow-up with you now i mean next time with your new your next opportunity we'd love to hear what you're doing how you're bringing in rebound hiring in your next gig as well uh, but for today, thanks for joining us. It's been a pleasure having you on Work Smart. Always a pleasure, mate. Thank you for having me. Cheers.